All right, awesome. Well, hey, uh, thanks for sticking around for the afternoon sessions. My name is Clay Smith. I'm a developer advocate at a company called New Relic. New Relic, uh, if you haven't heard of uh, us, we're a company in San Francisco that does software analytics. And typically and historically, we've done performance analytics for different types of backends. More recently, in the past couple of years, we've been focusing on mobile and browser performance as well. And my job uh, at the company is specifically mobile related. And one really cool uh, side effect of that is I get to see a lot of emerging trends and technologies in the mobile space. And one of the big ones, especially the past few years, is back into service platforms. And uh, full disclosure, I don't work for any of the companies mentioned, and there's no uh, partnership agreement or anything like that. So I'm just speaking about these, uh, these technologies as an interested developer. And I think the, the key, the key like, takeaway from this talk, and what I think is really interesting, is uh, the first thing is that uh, a bunch of very large tech companies are investing a lot in these technologies, and they're maturing very rapidly. And hand in hand with that, we're seeing that the ability to use these platforms to build real working apps on uh, is becoming more and more viable for a lot of different sorts of apps. And because it's relatively easy to get started on these platforms, there's kind of this promise, and the reason why they want you to give them uh, your money is they want to kind of accelerate the typical things you have to do to build backends to support apps. And this talk uh, is really uh, just an introduction to these platforms. I apologize in advance if you're already an advanced PARS or Firebase developer. Uh, some of these concepts will seem familiar, but if you're new, uh, hopefully you'll walk away with some knowledge about what these platforms are all about, how to use them, and maybe if they're right or wrong for uh, your next project. A little bit about me. Uh, I'm obviously, as I said, a developer advocate at New Relic, uh, but I come from a web and mobile uh, uh, application development background, uh, just in general under the application development umbrella, doing a lot of uh, Ruby on Rails, Node.js, Java, and more recently uh, some Swift and Android work. But, uh, you know, through building a lot of different types of apps, particularly in the software and service space, uh, I find that I'm kind of writing code that solves the same problem over and over again. I, I don't know how many times I've written a, like a login form for a username and password, and that's what's somewhat exciting about these platforms and products is there's this contract, a promise to developers that use them that, hey, these things that you're doing all the time in application development, each time you build a new app, uh, we have an easy API for you to use and it kind of works like magic. And with that in mind, the structure of the talk here, the agenda is, excuse me, <clears throat> is kind of what uh, building mobile apps, and to some extent front-end apps as well, uh, looks like today in late 2015. And then hand-in-hand uh, -hand with that is what do the backends, the power of these apps, look like as well. And moving on from that, we'll jump into backends as a service platforms as well. I know the talk description mentioned Apache user grid. Uh, apologies to user grid fans. Uh, we'll be focusing mostly on two very big ones. Uh, Firebase from Google and Paris from Facebook and see some code. And then from there, uh, we'll be talking about one thing that I think is pretty interesting. It's kind of application architecture for backends of service platforms, uh, specifically all of the interesting event driven stuff, which has uh, been evolving very uh, rapidly in the past six to eight months. And then finally, talking a little bit about performance and uh, a really straightforward benchmark I wrote and the results from that. And so that's kind of where we're going and where we'll uh, end up at the time here, and there'll be some time for some questions. But with that in mind, uh, let's talk about kind of mobile app development today. Uh, it, who here builds mobile apps currently? Mobile app devs? Okay, so this, this should seem very, very familiar. And the first thing and the most obvious thing is for smartphones, for feature phones, we live in this multi-platform world. It's Depending on the country and region, it's some mixture of iOS and Android. And the ideal here and the, uh, the selling point of uh, backend as a service is that you don't want to have a duplicate backend for iOS and Android. You want them to share the same server side logic. And if at all possible, move as much um, business logic out of the apps and into the backend. So you can reduce the amount of code you duplicate in each mobile client. 
And especially if you're supporting, um, well, I, I hope I hope not, but you know, BlackBerry and Windows Phone or a, uh, a mobile web application, um, you end up duplicating more and more client-side logic. So the, the idea here is to push more and more of that to the back end with obviously a lot of caveats. The second thing is that apps are, are obviously more and more international, and I, I don't necessarily mean to speak about internationalization, translating the app to different languages. I mean specifically that the Apple App Store and the Google Play Store, uh, unlike 10 years ago, have this unprecedented way to immediately distribute the apps you built to a global audience instantly, which is extremely powerful and something that makes uh, mobile uh, a fairly unique platform in terms of global distribution. Uh, of course, uh, all of the phones we have in our pockets have some variety of sensors. The things I, I think are really important, of course, are uh, the camera and GPS. Uh, we've seen very interesting apps being built on top of that. And that goes, and that, that's very closely related to the how apps, much like web pages nowadays, have to be super responsive. Has anyone seen that? Uh, it's kind of it's been making the rounds for a couple of years. It's the different Android screen sizes. It's like a it's like a mosaic of different triangles, and it's it's massive, and it shows the thousands of different screen sizes and configurations for different types of Android apps. So, this idea that five years ago that you have you know a couple small you have a couple flavors of Android phones and you know maybe two versions of iPhone, and that screen size is the same has been completely thrown out the window. And we see different uh, SDKs to manage that. But by far the most important, and by far the most interesting, I think, for back into the service, is that these apps are uh, extremely connected to the cloud. In the early days of Android and iOS, I'm talking uh, pre-3G, uh, these apps, like you, you basically wouldn't use your phone without a Wi-Fi connection. And now, I mean, thanks to faster, faster cellular modems and uh, better cellular networks, at least in North America and Europe, uh, we're able to build apps that have a, a strong assumption, not 100% assumption, but a strong assumption that there'll be some sort of cellular data or, or Wi-Fi connection available. And with that is this related, um, mostly related trend that uh, the amount of mobile data globally keeps going up at a very rapid pace. This is, <laughs> this is a fake graph actually, but you, you kind of get the idea. It's based on, there are dozens of these floating around, but uh, as of this year, 2015, mobile web traffic uh, surpassed uh, mobile internet traffic, and we see this uh, continuing in a really strong way. And that data, of course, is images, audio, and video, but it's also increasingly uh, API requests issued from apps to some backend. Uh, and uh, part of that is analytics, but a lot of it, of course, is logic that's supporting your apps and is making it function. One thing I, I think actually that gets kind of not mentioned uh, enough when we're talking about mobile data is push notifications. And the reason that's so important, I think, is because so many, um, so many very important apps, WhatsApp being one of them, uh, just wouldn't really function the same way without having that two-way channel between the app and being able to push data to it as well. So push is such a, a, a critical feature for uh, a, number, a number of apps and we don't see that, uh, that declining at all. In fact, I, I would go as far to say that push notifications and the lack of push notification support in mobile web applications, there's a spec floating around. Of course, vendors haven't adopted yet, but that's, um, that's in some ways holding back uh, mobile web, I think. So with all of those features, with all of those, um, with, with kind of the way we build apps today, uh, they need a backend. And the way we build a backend uh, varies widely, uh, app to app, but uh, just to kind of call back to where we started from, uh, which was essentially a, a server closet in the 90s, depending on the size of your organization, maybe you had something sophisticated. This, I'm somewhat nostalgic for this photo because this was my uh, first job. I was an intern and they put the interns in the server room, which, um, which maybe that's not that uncommon actually, but uh, the, the thing that made it, the, there were two reasons why it was a particularly painful internship. I, I learned a lot, but the first reason was uh, it was in Texas, which the server room in Texas in the summer gets quite hot. And the second reason is I was writing PHP 3 code. So uh, two, uh, two pretty memorable experiences. Uh, fortunately, uh, these server rooms are going away to potentially save future interns the, uh, the uh, 
you know, the dignity of, of working in the, uh, the back room there. And we now have all of these fancy infrastructure as a service providers. Uh, funny story about this photo, it's basically impossible, or it's, it's more challenging than I thought to find stock photos of data centers because uh, it's, it's just people are very secretive and there were, uh, there were very few of the inside of, like I wanted to see the inside of an AWS data center, but uh, not surprisingly that was difficult to find. So this is the exterior of a large data center. But the idea here, cloud computing, or even if you're, um, you're buying space in a co-location facility, that we've got these very large buildings, often in remote places, with access to cheap electricity. And you know, you don't have to run your own physical hardware for some, anymore. Uh, someone manages it for you. Unfortunately, uh, even with uh, having all of these services that mean you don't have to deal with physical hardware anymore, there's still uh, a massive amount of complexity in managing that. Uh, security is obviously uh, the very, the, the really big one. Even if physical security, the, the physical security of the servers you don't have to worry about, all of these uh, facilities have excellent physical security, you still have to do quite a lot of operational work to maintain these backends. There's provisioning, deploying, and then you need to make sure they're up. So lots of monitoring and then alerting to make sure you know when they're going down or having problems. And the really, really big one, it's scaling. And as, as, apps, uh, you know, as apps take off in the app store, uh, you've got to make sure that your backends can scale with those apps as more and more people download them. And that is uh, that's, that's, is a hard problem. It will continue to be a very hard problem. So after infrastructure as a service in the past few years, uh, most notably Heroku, we end up with platform as a service. And you know, the promise of platform as a service is, hey, don't worry so much about uh, infrastructure anymore. When you magically push to a specific uh, GitHub remote branch, we'll just deploy that code as it exists in that branch automatically to your remote server, which I, I, I do, I really will admit, felt like magic the first time. I pushed a, a Rails app to a remote branch on GitHub and it was just suddenly available on a, on a funny Heroku URL. And I think one of the, uh, one of the things that's driving this move to, uh, to different services, to different cloud services that hide more of, more of the details is this really great uh, Larry Wall quote. And it says, uh, most of you are familiar with the virtues of a programmer. It's laziness and patience and hubris. And that's not uh, meant to be a slam against uh, programmers or myself. I think what it really means is that we want things to be fast and we don't want things to be really difficult. So we end up moving to higher and higher level abstractions for application development. And I, I don't think that's really a bad thing or that means we're bad computer scientists, that we want to get away from the physical hardware. I think it also doesn't mean that you know, building on top of very high level abstractions as mobile developers, as front-end developers, or as application developers in general, that necessarily makes things easier. I think that's very much a choice of how we spend our time and that spending time on server security, on provisioning, on deployments, on managing application state, uh, we're trading that time for worrying about other things. And particularly important in the mobile space is the experience of people using the app, which is a, a very hard problem that won't be solved by a, you know, a cloud service anytime soon. So in this world of you know, we've got infrastructure as a service, we've got you know, things like AWS, uh, Rackspace, uh, Azure, and then we've got the platform as a service companies like Heroku. Uh, since around 2011, we end up with something like uh, back as a service. And 2011 is when uh, PARS launched. To kind of, I have a quick illustration of the back as a service world. Uh, this is the very, very, very simplified web application architecture. So say a, a simple Rails CRUD app, but it's really language of your choice where you have application servers and a database. You've got uh, mobile, web, whatever, third-party clients talking over the internet. They hit some sort of load balancer which spans out requests to uh, you know, an application server, and those application servers uh, have some way to persist data likely over a relational database, maybe, uh, maybe NoSQL, MongoDB, something like that as well. But this, um, this architecture, whether it physically exists in hardware, whether it's all virtualized on, um, on a provider like Amazon Web Services, 
or whether you're like actually running it, you know, in in your server closet, uh, it, it really hasn't changed much for uh, web application architecture. Uh, yet, as we saw before, you know, there's still um, a significant um, a significant cost to maintaining this infrastructure, especially for very small and simple apps. So, you know, back into the service, uh, PARS and, and others before them realized that, hey, you know, let's just replace all of that with a black box with a REST API. And the idea here is that instead of worrying about all those details and having to manage it yourself, you trust the provider and they give you an API and you talk to that API and you get much of the same features. I think, uh, you know, Surprisingly, not surprisingly, Wikipedia has a has a really great definition for backend as a service, and, and I, I like this one. It's uh, a model to provide developers a way to link uh, their app to backend cloud storage and other APIs, we'll say. And that storage is so key because that's one of the big uh, one of the main difficulties, one of the main challenges facing developers who want to have um, shared persistence across different platforms. And almost all of the providers start providing storage, but the idea is that you know, if you want to uh, create some sort of schema with relationships between objects, uh, make it extremely easy to, uh, to persist that and fetch it and deal with all of the intricacies of moving state around different applications and into a backend. The other big feature you see in a lot of these providers is single sign-on, and this is so critical for mobile because we know from personal experience and from apps, very popular apps in the App Store, that people really, really don't like typing in their username and password, like, like one star review, don't like. So we end up going with single sign-on, and by that I mean uh, you know, logging out with Facebook, Twitter, Google, uh, GitHub, and providing people the ability just to click a button in your app and we know we can confirm their identity. And SQL sign-on also applies to, um, to enterprise technology as well. More and more companies are centralizing their login into um, an, identity, an identity provider that, um, that kind of centralizes that as well. Uh, because it's a developer uh, product too, these providers typically have some sort of concept of a, a very fancy web console. So you log into uh, one of these services and you'll actually be able to view and edit your data in a very nice HTML5 interface, which is very useful and it makes it less intimidating. On top of that, you can also uh, run analytics and query the data as well. Um, obviously, multi-platform, uh, enough said there, but <clears throat> the, these providers, these platforms have very, very high quality client libraries in iOS, and Android, and uh, in JavaScript typically, that are almost always open source and allow you to interact with uh, their APIs at a, at a high level. So even though they've already done the, the hard work of kind of creating and designing these APIs for your apps to talk to, uh, they're also providing a variety of client libraries that you just kind of inject into the apps and you're, you're more or less ready to go. For some in particular, knowing that push notifications are such a critical feature for a number of apps, uh, hopefully not being used in kind of the spammy way where they, um, they, they, you know, they notify you to uh, like a, a store special or something, but being used in a responsible way, uh, a very straightforward way to register for push notification. And anyone who's had to set up Apple push notification or uh, Google, Google Cloud messaging on their own server uh, knows that's not exactly trivial. Um, kind of wrapping up the, uh, the feature list, uh, real-time ability, uh, if you use uh, HipChat or Slack or, or any messaging apps, uh, having that real-time connection to a backend is so important, but on the other hand, it's very difficult to roll your own correctly the first way, the first time, uh, many try. Uh, and again, many of these companies provide an API and uh, kind of a two-way channel to make real-time data in the apps very uh, straightforward. And, you know, security, they're obviously going to use SSL. Uh, a big debate that's part of the, uh, the cloud security debate. Personally, I, I don't think uh, there's been, there have been any convincing arguments that um, on-premises versus a hosted solution is inherently less secure. Um, but 
you are trusting these providers to um, you know uh, have the have the correct certifications and you know use the uh, the right sort of SSL certificates to make sure that uh, your your data is secure that you're uh, you're passing to the cloud. Uh, that brings us to the, the BAS big three, the three, um, three pretty big players uh, in BAS, and they all have an associated uh, large tech company associated with them. Uh, the first, of course, and the oldest, well, the, the, oldest, um, the, the oldest mobile backend service provider that's uh, very popular today is PARS, a Facebook company acquired two years ago followed by Firebase, Google's, uh, Google's version of it, uh, with a very strong real-time focus, acquired just last year. And uh, for the Apple fans in the room, uh, Apple's own uh, offering, CloudKit, iCloud for developers, that is very much done the Apple way and not, not acquired. Uh, also, uh, also worth mentioning, uh, Apache user grid, of course, which is the open source solution. The idea here is you deploy it to your own servers and you have much of the same. User grid has high quality uh, SDK libraries built in. You just need to, uh, to deploy it yourself and manage it yourself. Uh, Amazon, the 800 pound gorilla of the web service world, has a mobile hub in beta that just launched uh, two or three months ago. Uh, Microsoft has Azure mobile web services and there are several other smaller players too, uh, and I don't mean to diminish them at all by, by putting them there. They're all um, they're all well-respected. Kidney, Seneco, Apogee, Accelerator, and uh, and many more. Typically, they go through some sort of uh, process like this. The new ones they focus on persistence first, then they go to authentication, and then they start to layer on more advanced APIs like push or analytics. The key metrics in uh, kind of evaluating these, these uh, platforms is kind of what they allow you to do, and, and this is, drives how much they charge you as well. The uh, four or so, four or five main things are um, the number of requests per minute they allow. So when your app is fetching data or pushing data, it's, um, it's making a request, and that is uh, rate limited per app. There's also the data transfer between your app and their backends and the storage costs, and uh, that's persistence. Uh, two classes, the database, uh, so how much you're persisting uh, in some sort of schema, and then there's the second cheaper class, which is uh, just assets, images, audio, video, um, static assets, that is. So let's, uh, let's finally uh, see some code here. Um, the, all these are uh, Android code examples, but very, very straightforward. You, uh, you plop some uh, dependencies into your Gradle file, and you're, uh, you're ready to use a library. That brings you to initialization, both in your activity on create. You initialize it with the context, and you give it an API key or client key in Parse's case. Uh, in Firebase, um, you don't have an, uh, an API key that identifies your application. You actually have a, uh, a URL. So when you create a Firebase application, uh, you can either give it a specific name or it'll generate, um, much like Heroku, kind of a funny name with a number that you then uh, reference there directly. One of the hard problems of mobile, and they do a very good job of this, is handling authentication in a variety of ways that would take you a really long time to uh, do yourself. This is based uh, on public documentation about uh, a couple weeks ago. It's, uh, it's an interesting list, and you can kind of tell which uh, BAS provider uh, belongs to which company based on, uh, based on what they support and what they don't support. Uh, the Apple exception, of course, is, is always in play here. Um, Apple, if you want to use iCloud, uh, you're, you're, gonna, you're gonna use CloudKit. Um, and, uh, and nothing else. Uh, not to say you can enroll your own, but I'm talking about uh, single sign-on that's built into the products. Uh, username, pass, uh, username, password is just traditional, hey, give a password, give your email, and we'll sign you in. Anonymous uh, we'll talk about next, which I think is, is pretty cool. And, and really a useful pattern for mobile app development in general. So the idea with anonymous authentication and, and one you see quite often is you want people to use your app the first time after they download it without having to sign in. 
So imagine you're building some sort of shopping cart app. You want people to add things to the shopping cart before they just sign their created accounts and actually buy things. You want to block people with the login, um, the login gates. So they both provide this uh, idea of an anonymous user. Uh, in Parse's case, they call it enable automatic user. And what that does is, if uh, enable automatic user is, uh, is turned on, uh, when you get the current user, it'll be guaranteed to exist even if someone hasn't signed on. Which, what that means is you can then start associating data with that user, and uh, you can convert it then down the road to a real user. Firebase, similar concept, off anonymously, and then there's a uh, callback there with um, the result handler, success or fail. Not, uh, not too interesting. Pars has a really cool feature, and it automatically migrates an anonymous user to a real user. Um, so that's that's basically the uh, the conversion step there. So once someone has logged in, you can take the anonymous user and then link it to a real user, and it'll automatically import all that data associated with the anonymous user to the real user account, uh, which is a really uh, a nice to have. Uh, less interesting here is the um, username and password off. Pretty what you see is, is what you get here. Um, some username and password and uh, sign up in background. Almost all of these uh, libraries, PARS in particular, uh, is very explicit on whether there is a callback and whether it's happening in the background thread or not. They actually use the word background, which is nice. And uh, it accepts an optional callback if you want to handle success or failure. Uh, same for Firebase, uh, it returns the, uh, the, the map of the, of the user object there in the callback. Um, authentication's you know, kind of a useful first step. Um, data persistence is where uh, the real benefit of these, these apps uh, really, really lie. For an example app, I made this is a really simple uh, schema here, uh, a user and a retrospective. It's a simple sprint retrospective app, but you have a many-to-many -many relationship and then a one-to-many relationship. It's really trivial to, uh, to set this up in PARS. You create an object called a, called a PARS object. You give it any string, and you can put a uh, hash map here, any arbitrary data, including a, a user object. And then using get relation, you can create relationships and uh, dot add. It's, a, it's an array, and you're you're pretty much if you call save in background, it goes to the server. Uh, optional callback if you wanted to handle failure. Uh, fetching an ORM like syntax where equal to find in background, the callback will have the results. Uh, I've, I've done this in iOS with. Uh, with um, you know core data and uh, AF networking, uh, we're, we're talking the difference between um, you know dozens to hundreds <laughs> to hundreds of lines of code to uh, you know less less than ten, which is which is kind of nice. Firebase, very similar. The one main call out, the main main difference in Firebase is unlike Pars, which has a data model that's very much inspired by relational databases. In Pars, everything is a JSON object. So you do have to denormalize. There's a great article on Pars web, Pars, and sorry, on Firebase's website if you want to look, learn more. But ultimately, um, you have to reference a specific path in Firebase. Again, the hash map comes back up, and then you push it and set the value. The fetching is, is particularly interesting because of Firebase's real-time features. So uh, add value event listener will actually listen for all future changes on that path. So the first time you call it, it's guaranteed, well, assuming, <laughs> assuming you can access the network and it's a valid path, it will come back with the data. But then, for all future changes on that path, uh, on data change will be called back. So if you're building some sort of chat app or a real-time app, they make, um, they make listening for additional events and, um, and value changes on that path uh, uh, re remarkably uh, straightforward. Uh, which is, is very powerful. And they're using a, a WebSockets there. And speaking of WebSockets, um, one kind of side note about uh, real-time events, uh, CloudKit uh, uses Apple push notifications. So the, uh, you can also listen for event changes on your schema in CloudKit. And it'll actually send CloudKit a Apple push notification, not, um, not one you can see on your home screen or phone, but it'll actually use that as the push mechanism and Firebase uses WebSockets uh, for uh, iOS and Android. 
uh, PARS, uh, the real-time features, um, uh, a little bit less developed, but using uh, HTTP, I should have said HTTPS, of course. Um, as I said before, you know, uh, Firebase, and you'll see this in other uh, BAS providers as well, um, different opinions on persistence. But the, uh, the danger here is there is an upper limit to how deeply nested your JSON objects can be. So if you ended up with a massively complex uh, Firebase data schema, schema, your performance is absolutely going to suffer. And the very high level workaround is to start to denormalize your, uh, your JSON uh, objects into, uh, into different paths. And uh, more information uh, on that is definitely. Um, one of the last challenges and, and really challenging things uh, that mobile devs face, uh, I've been here myself, it's uh, connectivity. And that's dealing with uh, saving and error handling when there's no internet connection. You drive into a tunnel or something. PARS has um, this idea of a local data store, which is actually a SQLite database, uh, I believe, um, which at least in iOS, you have to import the, the SQLite um, dependency. But calling save eventually uh, is, is very cool. It means uh, when the network is unavailable, uh, it'll wait uh, until it becomes available again to save. And until it does sync with the server, it'll be available in the local data store. And so when you're uh, creating, when you're writing fetch queries, you can specify whether you want to look only on the network or also on the local data store. Uh, additionally, um, you can persist data only locally and not sync to the server, and they provide different API methods to uh, you know, distinguish between the two. So potentially really powerful for building uh, an offline app uh, that eventually syncs. Um, Firebase, this is mostly automatic, uh, the, the caveat, is that um, it's in memory. So if you force quit the app and it wasn't able to sync, um, you would lose that state. Uh, they allow you to persist it by um, calling a set persistence enabled uh, equal to true. At this point, you might be thinking about UI programming, right? So uh, the very, very common use cases, the one you see in almost every app is I want to call an API and show a list of data, right? Uh, some sort of REST API endpoint and show me a list of things that can display in an Android list or an iOS uh, UI table view. Both, um, both projects have, um, well, Firebase UI for iOS and Android and PARS UI for iOS and Android. And uh, in the Android case, they have adapters that connect to, um, to some list of data and will, uh, automatically provide that adapter for an Android list view, which um, makes kind of that boilerplate code. If you've ever uh, you know, written some sort of view that fetches, uh, fetches from a road server, it, it makes that uh, really trivial. And there are other um, adapters in the, um, in the UI library as well for other different types of common widgets. Uh, the other nice thing is um, it handles pagination and in infinite scroll really nicely too. So that's just kind of built, uh, built in there. Uh, to kind of wrap up the, uh, the code discussion, worth, worth calling out uh, things that are not discussed in interest of time. Um, authorization, determining who gets what and what the permission level is on these different objects you create is obviously very well developed in both. And you can set up ACLs and, um, and different rules on, um, on visibility, particularly the, uh, you kind of have reasonable projections on how many people are going to use the app. Uh, it could be really powerful. Um, that said, uh, just as, as a developer and someone who you know, has occasional side projects, these, uh, these platforms are really fun for, for hack days or just a uh, crazy app idea you have. And it's, uh, it's a great way to get started to see, uh, see how they work. On that note, uh, I think I've got a couple minutes for, for questions. See who has any. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, what about IBM and uh, Groom? Yes, yes. Uh, I, I know I, I was going to leave uh, some out. The, the list is, is quite long. And uh, I know IBM, uh, I was talking to someone who was saying that Bluemix has really attractive pricing right now. Um, 
but uh, I, I unfortunately don't have uh, much experience with it. And uh, the list uh, is, is ever growing from providers. So um, it's, it's definitely worthwhile to, uh, to be, um, be pretty comprehensive in your evaluation, if, uh, especially if they're giving it away for free. And so I think there was one more question back there. Yeah? Yeah. Um, are you familiar with the Berkeley stack and attempts to abstract away from the vendor lock in like Mesos? Uh, no, I'm not. Uh, can, you, can you repeat the question? In oh, my I'm sorry. Uh, the, the, the question was, am I familiar with the Berkeley stack and the attempts to uh, abstract away with Mesos? Yeah, Mesos is one of the three key components in the Berkeley stack. And it's the same idea of having sort of a abstraction, CPU, storage, all of that abstracted away. But it's it'll run on any cloud provider. And it's a little bit behind. They don't have a version one release yet. But a lot of stuff is actually being built on it right now. That's uh, that's really interesting. Um, any uh, any commercial products at this point, or uh, yeah, if you go to the Mesos website, you'll see. Okay, yeah. So um, definitely add uh, Mesos to the, uh, the list of uh, yeah. Yeah, I don't know whether it's as brain dead simple because you're still going to choose a back end cloud provider to run it on, but it's yeah. abstracted so that you're not locked in. Yeah, and that's that sounds really powerful. Yeah, thank you. Uh, anyone else? Oh, yeah. Um, do you know if Parse has any plans to like have data centers in Europe or something? <laughs> well, I mean, given uh, let's see, given this this graph, you you do uh, kind of have to wonder, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I, I yeah, I I do wonder. Um, I, I I can't speak to uh, to Parse's or, or Facebook's plans though. I'm I'm sure. This is not news to them, though. This is uh, not exactly original research. No. Yeah, one more question about yeah. tuning. So at the end of the day, somebody still has to look at what's actually happening to figure out where the bottlenecks are, or are you completely and totally treating this like a black box and you don't worry about it at all? Oh, I, I think it would be a, mis uh, a huge mistake to, uh, to treat it like a <laughs> black box. You ultimately... This is this is not real. These are not real people using the app. This is just a simulated test to give you an idea of how it might work in Asia without having real user data. I think uh, the best practice is to obviously obviously measure what's happening uh, in real life in your app and to collect the timings of API requests, regardless of what you use, so you can actually get uh, an understanding of what's happening in the real world and not just uh, you know a simulated really simple benchmark. And are those analytic tools that they provide, the vendors provide, sufficient to do that? Um, Parse's tools seem a little bit uh, more well-developed. If, if you'll uh, forgive the product pitch, uh, the company I work for also has an <laughs> excellent tool for that as well. Um, but, uh, but yeah, that's typically, um, to get to that real user data, you're going to have to use uh, an additional tool to collect that and you know, uh, send it somewhere. But I think that's very important. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you for the great talk. Um, I'm new to this, so maybe this question sounds a bit ignorant. But um, can you do you have an idea about the adoption? How many companies, how many apps are are using all those services? That's a that's a really great question. As far as I know, um, Pars and, and Firebase have been pretty quiet about their their actual numbers. Um, I, I'm. I, I would I will get back to you though on whether um, anyone or any analysts have you know done an industry report on the overall adoption rate. Uh, I can say anecdotally though um, that all of the major tech companies in the world are investing heavily. So uh, at least some some business people feel like there's potentially a future, which uh, is is in, it's not always a good sign, but it's uh, not a bad sign either. And I think uh, I think I've time for one last question uh, before uh, I'm out of time. Okay, cool. Well, on that note, I think that's uh, that's about it. Uh, hey, thanks very much, and uh, looking forward to uh, yeah, talking to you more uh, later this evening.